today's event is uh, on the, the core subject matter of, of issue five of the journal, Fundamentalism and Secular States. Um, but what I want to do is just to mention uh, a little um, of the other articles. There are a number of articles that are not on that key topic, and I want to just talk a little bit about some of those articles. So the first one I'd like to mention is an interview by Stephen Cowden, who's one of our core um, feminist dissent uh, members, with uh, Caroline Forrest, who's a journalist, filmmaker, and writer and columnist with Charlie Hebdo and Le Monde. Um, she began, um, according to this interview, she began as a critic of Christian fundamentalism in France, which she linked to the far right. Um, she then moved to focus partly on Afghanistan and, and on linking, and this is very important for, um, for feminist dissent, um, on linking Jewish, Muslim and Christian forms of fundamentalism. Um, and as we do, she characterizes uh, fundamentalist forms of religion through the desire to capture the political domain, sometimes through violent means. Um, and she makes the really important point to my mind that we ought not to be referring to Muslims, Christians, Hindus, as though they're a homogeneous group. Um, rather, what we need to do is focus on what all the various forms of fundamentalism have in common. Um, indeed, some Muslims are targeted by fundamentalist Islamists. Um, Forrest also defends the right to blaspheme, to satirize religious practices uh, that, for example, involve the control of women's bodies. Um, and she finally, the final po point I'd like to mention is that she moves then to an issue which is dear to my heart, as well as to some of the other people on the, the journal, which is that the principles like the right to free speech, freedom of religion, but also to blaspheme are vital. And we ought not to confuse the defense of human rights and universalism with cultural imperialism of colonial and imperial powers. So that's her, a very brief summary of, of, of Forrest's interview um, with Stephen Cowden. Our second longer piece that I want to mention very briefly is a piece that I wrote with Maria Bonetti. Uh, it's called Postmodern Postfeminism Without Women. And I want to stress at the beginning that this piece does not represent a line that feminist dissent is taking, but it's a conversation about these issues. Uh, and briefly, it's about the work of a Spanish philosopher and activist, Paul Preciado. And I just want to give two reasons why I believe personally that um, a critique of their work, of Preciado's work, is important and of interest to feminist dissent. Um, one is that taken to extremes, the idea of choice of sexual sex and sexual practices can lead, and it does in some cases, I, I believe in the work of Paul Preciado, to the support of practices that indeed control and abuse the bodies of women. Um, there's a reference to supporting the uh, in places in, in there, in Preciado's work. And secondly, I, I believe there's a parallel with the point that's just made about by um, Forrest, that universalism ought not to be confused with cultural imperialism uh, of colonial imperial powers. And Preciado does associate universalisms, um, including the belief that there are, there's a category woman with normative discourses, uh, of, of, with the discourses of colonialism and imperialism. And now finally, um, and briefly, I just want to mention a really important area of our journal, uh, which is called Voices of Dissent. Um, and I'm sure many of you will agree with me if I say that things look pretty bleak out there in the world at the moment. Um, and I think this section really gives us glimmers of hope from a number of different areas of the world. Um, for example, there's a piece by Amita Ahmed, a really powerful piece on the Sudanese women's key role in the toppling of the regime of Omer al-Bashi, an Islamist military regime. Women stormed the streets, she writes, despite the brutality of the regime. And she notes that women were rebelling both against the military system and as well as the patriarchal state. 
So there were many martyrs of this action, but women continue, she writes, to this day to mobilize for representation and against all forms of patriarchal power. Just two more brief articles I'll, I'll mention. Andrea Peto has written a moving piece headed Fear Eats the Soul, Self-Quarantining in an Illiberal State, a, a, a beautiful title. And to quote from her, there's not another EU member country which has been using taxpayers' money from other EU member states for generating fear as a form of governance like Hungary. Hungary serves as the laboratory, she writes, of illiberal policies. Um, and two areas she mentions is the, um, the Soros, the university run by Soros, uh, and him being the target of an anti Semitic campaign and gender studies being transformed into a threat to the nation. And of course, her writing about this in a way is a form of resistance to it. So good for her. And finally, there's an article by Shirin Rai. And given what's happened since, we, we've almost forgotten this, but um, I'm sure many of you haven't. She writes about the largely female-led protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act that erupted covering women of all classes, religions, and races in India just before the pandemic took hold. Rai points to the imaginative form that the protests took. They occupied a road, for example, and turned it into a garden, a bache, a garden of hope. Um, and on a very positive note, she manages to draw parallels with other struggles in the world. So that's my very brief introduction to the pieces that, not, that are not on the core topic of today's meeting. I hope you'll, some of you will read some of these and get something out of them. Um, and for now, I will hand over to Rashmi, who's going to chair the, the conversation in the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alison, for that. And uh, welcome all. Um, I actually want to begin with uh, a poem. Uh, another section that we had in issue five uh, was entitled Poetry of Resistance. Um, and most of the poems we took were poems that were written during the Anti-Citizenship Amendment Act that was passed by the Indian government uh, in January, December, January 2019. 2020. Um, so this is a poem that I translated uh, from uh, the Urdu, and it's called The Girls of Jamia, and the poet is Amir Aziz. It's translated from the original in Urdu. The poem is Amir Aziz's tribute to the women students of Jamia Milia Islamia, whose campus was invaded by the police on 15th December 2019. The students of the university had been protesting the Discriminatory Citizenship Amendment Act that had been introduced by the government. Many of the women students who had been at the forefront of the protests were injured in the violence. I hope this translation captures some of the dynamism and rebellious energy that was aroused when Amir Aziz read and performed this poem during the protests. The poem catapults the young women protesters to, to the real and imaginative center of resistance. So here's the poem. The girls of Jamia. They unmask kings. They launch revolutions through subtle glances, the girls of Jamia. As they tear apart the garb of patriarchy, people clear the path ahead when they embark stubbornly on their journey, the girls of Jamia. And when the police raise their batons and the people throw stones and screams are heard from the slaughterhouse and human breaths are scuffled, the sighs are stifled, the eyes downcast. And when people begin to pay obeisance to injustice and power, and when the slaves tire of fighting the masters, when the broken shards of humanity fall in pieces on the road, they clench their fists and raise a cry, the girls of Jamia. When debased men fall even further and stars appear to take a first look at them 
before ascending the skies, they clench their fists and raise a cry, the girls of Jamia. When the embers imprisoned in the kitchen fires ignite torchlights and the melancholic sounds of prisoners' chains become the rousing call of freedom, they clench their fists and raise a cry, the girls of Jamia. They sound the death knell of the autocrat as the oppressor's land quakes and reality merges with dreams. They are neither someone's mother, nor daughter, nor wife, nor sister, the girls of Jamia. They are no one's honor, no one's pride, no one's home, no one's life. They live life, they also smoke cigarettes. They are the embodiment of a carefree life, the girls of Jamia. So keep your views to yourself. If need be, take cover in the job. They're experts in splitting hairs, the girls of Jamia. In the revolutionary songs inscribed on history's pages, in the verses written in the holy book, in their hearts and their minds, all the world's women are the girls of Jamia. And I think today we can, um, you know, uh, think about the women in Afghanistan as, uh, or dedicate this poem to the women of Afghanistan. So welcome all to this discussion on secular states, fundamentalist politics, which was the focus of our special issue. As Alison already said, you can read the entire journal online at feministdescent.org. I'm joined now by four of the contributors to the special issue, and I would invite them to unmute themselves and to make themselves visible. Denise Candiotti, Neera Yuval Davis, Geeta Segal, and I hope I know Ro and Rohini Hensman. I will not go into extensive biographical accounting of their contributions to feminist thinking and practice. Each of them is exemplary and is already very well known for uh, their work. And our Eventbrite link contains short biographical information about each of them. So instead, I'm going to jump straight into the conversation and begin by saying welcome Rohini, Denise, Geeta, and Neera. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you all know, one of the key aims of our special issue is to present a set of historically and geographically situated analyses of the emergence and consolidation of feminist, of fundamentalist politics in secular states in the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, all too often, this is understood as a paradox and perhaps even as a tragedy in terms of how secular ideals seem to have been undermined throughout our modern histories. At the same time, we know that struggles for secular spaces, especially secular feminist spaces, continues. So in order to explore these issues, um, the way we will proceed is that I will pose a set of questions to our contributors and each of them will respond to the questions. But I also hope that the questions are read or unheard in the spirit of prompts rather than as anything too formal. Um, so let me begin. I want to begin by inviting you to reflect on how each of you in different ways has looked at the moment of the formation of different states as carrying both the promise, but also the potential pitfalls of state secularism. Gita and Amrita on India, Denise on Turkey, and Neera on Israel. Rohini, in your piece on abortion rights, you point to the ways in which the Catholic Church has exerted influence both in the US and in countries governed by left-wing regimes, either by successfully bypassing the state or infiltrating it. What tensions does that expose in terms of state formations that are ostensibly committed to secularism? And I guess a related question I want to sneak in here, which is the role of popular politics, both progressive and reactionary, 
and how they feed into the concept and the formation of secular states. What would we say to critics of state secularism who see it as a top-down ideology that ignores popular sentiments? Many populists today take this, have taken this line as they claim to represent the people. So um, over to the four of you. Who would like to begin? Okay. <laughs> um, shall, I, shall I jump in? Sure. So there were two articles on Hindutva in the um, in this issue. One was by me on um, uh, the sort of founding ideology of Hindutva, and the other was um, by Amrita on uh, Amrita Chachi on Hindutva, neoliberalism, and gender, um, and. I suppose I'd like to say that, that for me, and, and this is a very unfashionable position to take, uh, I'd like to say that there, obviously there were state, very many pitfalls and failures in what various states managed to deliver. But I'm going to take the, this unfashionable position that it isn't secularism's fault. Amrita Chachi, in her exploration of the connections between fundamentalism, neoliberalism, and gender, points Mom's out that... Cool. Hello. Go ahead, Gita. Someone. Although there were many um, uh, achievements uh, of Nehru's India and the early part of um, uh, Indian independence, there were crucial failures for which we're still paying a heavy cost today. The development of an excellent education system and a national health system are just two of those. But the founding promise of the national movement was reflected in the constitution and in India's contribution to universal human rights internationally. These were liberatory promises, and it is an, on upholding these that much of the resistance to the Hindutva project today is based. Of course, there were other failures of politics. Uh, one was to ensure a common legal framework, whether called, as in the early days, a uniform civil code, which the BJP, the Hindutva movement, then took on as a project of its own, or what feminists then called a gender just code uh, and of course to remove draconian colonial era laws such as sedition which we're seeing in many forms renewed today so we're fighting a whole new range um, of le legislation around sedition and terror and attempts to co control freedom online in media and covert and overt means so there are failures of the state but i would say that its promise remains one of the foundations of the resistance to the hindutva project Okay. Thanks, Gita. Maybe I will come in now in relating to Israel. Uh, Israel was founded by the Zionist movement that aspired to modernize uh, so-called the Jewish people and to normalize the Jewish people into a modern nation. At, this, uh, at the same time, it from the beginning have had a very difficult paradoxical relationship between secularism and religion in its formation. In the independence scroll, which was a foundational um, document uh, of Israel, it wasn't a constitution, but it was not, uh, a series of foundational law was supposed to gradually replace the role of uh, a constitution. It defined uh, Israel as a state which is both Jewish and democratic. Two years ago, a foundation law have defined finally Israel only as a Jewish state rather than as Jewish and democratic. That paradox has been from the beginning because the Zionist movement needed the Jewish religion for two basic legitimations. First of all, legitimation on the territory, the Holy Land, which this is more kind of the way that the Christians call it as a land, but the promised land that, Abra that God promised Abraham, the father of uh, the, the people to uh, living from biblical times. 
The second one was legitimation that Israel is going to represent the Jews all over the world. Unlike another uh, Jewish nationalist movement that emerged at the same time at the 19th century at um, East Europe, the Jewish bond, it did not just represent the Jews in East Europe or all over Europe, but all over uh, the world. And therefore it had to encompass all those who uh, followed uh, Jewish uh, practice. So this construction of the Jewish people and the Jewish land leaned on religion while most of the Zionists at that time were devout secularists. As the Israeli popular jokes uh, just goes, God does not exist, but he promised us the country. So we, with time, we have seen that this ambivalence and created a need from the beginning for the secular um, parties to come to compromise uh, relationships with the ultra-Orthodox Jewish parties, which were not Zionists, who also existed and lived in, in the country. And this basically meant that Israel continued the Ottoman Millet system in which a community or, or ethnic or religious origin and legal, especially legal uh, personal legal status uh, exist. And there were no secular spaces in which um, this kind of uh, overlapping um, existed. With time and uh, with new liberalization, with after the 67 war, especially the growing um, securitization and militarization of uh, an, an occupation of uh, Israel, we see the growing power of the religious, a certain kind especially, because there's more than one kind in which I expand more in, 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 in my paper, uh, exerting power on the um, Israel uh, government and power. Of course, there have been a lot of resistance from the seculars and what we see at the moment, after many years of Netanyahu as a prime minister, which both leaned on and was captivated by, because he himself is not uh, religious, the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox uh, parties, we see now uh, an attempt for a secular government. But uh, paradoxically, this secular government includes an Islamist party, a Palestinian Islamist party on the one hand, and a Jewish religion settler uh, party that although has only two members of parliament in the government is now its head is now the Israeli prime minister for the first two years rather than the head of the much larger secular party that heads this kind of coalition so it shows you the fragility and some would say the futility of secular resistance to what has become um, from the Israeli state. And I've not even started to explore why all this has happened in its history. Thank you. Okay. Um, if I come in here, I think that before I even start talking about the Turkish case, I'd like to step back a bit and define some terms because I'm somebody who questions both the notion of secularism as not a self-evident universal category, but one whose meaning and practice derives from specific historical context, nor am I comfortable with the term fundamentalist any longer in the 21st century and prefer the fuzzier concept of politicized religion. I'll explain why in a moment. But coming to the case of Turkey, the first question that I ask is how secular was the secular Turkish state? That's question number one. Now, we can answer this in two ways. If we understand by secularism, 
the separation of state and religion in the sense of having institutions of the state that are separate from the clerical and religious establishments and also voiding the public sphere from many of the markers of religion that were associated to the Ottoman phase, then you could say that has been achieved with the Republic to a certain extent, except what you got was not necessarily secularism, but state control over religion, which is not quite the same thing. And this was um, executed through the creation of the Directorate of Religious Affairs, where instead of clerical class, what you had was employees of the state who were tasked with regulating affairs of religion. Of course, this directorate was also a sop given to the majority uh, sect, which is the Sunni Hanafi uh, school of uh, Muslim jurisprudence. And schools of um, divinities, Imam Hatib schools, and there was an architecture, a sort of state-controlled architecture, if you like, of uh, the control of religion. If, however, by secularism, you mean a state that stands in an equidistant relationship to the various components of the, of the territory, of the nation, then you could argue that Turkey has never actually been secular because there was also the concept of the state-bearing people who are accepted to be Turkish ethnically and Hanafi Sunni in terms of religion. In other words, I think that we cannot separate the concept of secularism by who is included in the body of the nation, who qualifies as a national subject, a modern citizen, and who doesn't. And I think that it is over the boundaries of these concepts of exclusion and exclu of inclusion and exclusion that the whole debate about secularism is taking place. The case of India is fascinating in that respect. And I've done a comparison of Turkish and Indian secularism at one point early on, much earlier on. And I thought that the shape that secularism takes is so very, has both family resemblances with the Turkish case and massive differences. Because in the case of uh, India, the main obstacle, how do you create a nation from what is a nation of communities? Okay, so there was the whole issue of how do you overcome nationalism? Uh, how do you overcome communalism and create a nation? And finally, now we're back to a majoritarian exclusivist Hindutva conception whereby those who are not Hindus are expelled from the body politic, which is extremely convenient because then you don't have to address caste issues because you know even the lowest of the lower Hindu castes can, uh, can give one in the eye to a Muslim and nothing will happen to them, okay? So it, cr it creates automatically a hierarchy of power and worth within the society itself. So I think what is extremely important when we look at religion is to look at how it is used as an instrument of power and the consolidation of power in the period immediately after post-imperial and post-colonial state formation and in the changes in ruling elites throughout. How neoliberalism intervenes in jigging around these elites and creating new power centers and new establishments is another story. But the story fundamentalism remains the same. And this is that there has been a failure of modern citizenship in all the countries that we're talking about in the South. Because the concept of modern citizenship, i.e. equality before the law, regardless of gender, ethnic, religious, et cetera, differences, has in fact, practically, in practice, when you looked at the cases, never actually happened, <laughs> you know? I mean, you have, when you look really closely, even I think at the highest Nehruvian moment, I could still detect that there was a concept of the state-bearing people, 
It wasn't in Dutva, fair enough, but I would not have said that this was, it was a containment policy. And of course, instead of expelling religion from the public sphere, you had communities being allowed religious autonomy, as we saw in the famous Shah Banu case very long time ago, which was so well analyzed by Amrita Chachi. Uh, I am not going to talk, I'll stop. I'll come back to the politicized religion matter. But I think that we have to re-examine our concepts very carefully and absolutely not take for granted that we know their meaning. And I'll stop here. Okay, my, um, my presentation is slightly different because I'm dealing with uh, the issue of the abortion ban or uh, the, the opposition to abortion rights, which of course is not confined to any one country. In fact, it's unfortunately, now you find it all over the world. And specifically, uh, the Christian um, approach to abortion. Uh, and I found out some things which I was actually uh, unaware of before. One is that um, Rashmi mentioned the Catholic Church, which is one of the sources of the of very widespread abortion bans going on, but also there are um, evangelical, right-wing evangel evangelical churches, which are also spreading the same message. And what I found was that the, even the Catholic church, which has of course been around for centuries, um, that it became, um, it actually, uh, the current, extremely um, restrictive approach to abortion, where it considers, a, um, I don't know, an, a fertilized ovum as a full person, which cannot be aborted without committing uh, murder. That's relatively recent. It was only in the 19th century. And prior to that, uh, even the Pope considered that up to the time of um, the quickening, you know, when the you, the mother, the the woman starts to feel the, the fetus moving around, um, it was okay uh, to end a pregnancy, or at least it was not not a crime. So that was that was something which I didn't know before. And evangelical churches, for them, it's even more recent. Um, somewhere in the middle of the last century, 20th century, that they turned against abortion. So I think what that shows is that um, on, on, that's on one side. And on the other, of course, that there are um, Christian, Christians and Christian organizations and churches which are, on the one hand, who are not, uh, who are not in favor of any legal abortion ban, and in some cases have actually been um, supporting campaigns against the abortion ban and providing services, abortion services to women who need it and girls, of course. So I think what this shows is that, um, I, I'm not remembering who mentioned, uh, I, I think one of the other articles in, the, in this issue uh, which says that you cannot look at any religion as being homogeneous. You have a wide spectrum of opinions going from far right to far left in, in a certain sense within the same religion. And you simply cannot lump them together. And what you call either fundamentalism or politicized religion uh, is always on the far right of that spectrum. And you can have people within the same religion who are completely opposed, not only opposed, but are being killed sometimes in some cases by the people on the far right. And I think this um, also uh, brings up the question of what do we mean by secularism? And I think we may be clear, but many people, um, when they think about secularism, um, they see it as opposition to religion. And if, it, if that is what it means, um, understandably, one could feel that it is 
something coming from the top downwards because in our countries, at least the vast majority of people do follow one religion or another. So in that case, um, if you say it's the absence of religion, one could think of it as being against the vast majority of people. But if you see it in a different sense as um, a separation between religion and political power, then it is not any longer the absence of religion, but the, um, the, that the state treats everyone alike, regardless of their religion. And um, I think in, in, that, in that sense of secularism, we've said that secularism is a precondition for women's rights, but I think we also should add that it is a precondition for religious freedom. In one sense, that is obvious. If there's a majority religion, I mean, obviously, if it's linked to the state, it would be a majority religion if it's linked to political power. And minority religion, people who follow minority religions would not get their rights. But even for those of the majority religions, it means that imposed on them is a certain conception of their religion, which may be completely different from what they believe in. And I think in all these cases where we're talking about um, fundamentalism or politicized religion, um, it is completely wrong to think that it represents the majority of people who follow that religion, who may have a wide range of opinions, but certainly if you look at the the issue I was looking at, uh, the abortion ban, especially in its most extreme uh, versions, um, it is, I think it is certainly not, if you count women as people and as part of the population, it is certainly not representative of the majority. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Gita, did you want to, I thought I had a message from, do you want to come in on this now or later? Maybe. Uh, Gita, you're on mute. You're on mute. Very okay. quickly. Very, very quickly. quickly. Yes, I mean, I completely accept that there are many forms of, uh, of descriptions of secularism and that they're historically specific and so on. But I think that sometimes in examining these things academically, we forget that in the academy and outside, whether it's counter-terror and counter-extremism, think tanks, policy think tanks, um, uh, in, in, uh, in left movements and progressive movements, the idea of secularism, this core idea of separating religion and state in whatever form and creating the space for religious freedom, freedom from religion and freedom for religion within it has been lost. And therefore it's seen as entirely Western, uh, it, universalism is seen question. as bad and so on. So, okay. So that's my next <laughs> question, yes. Okay. Yes. So. Thanks all four of you. I mean, such uh, incredibly rich contributions, very provocative um, and uh, really, forcing us to rethink some of the terms, but also the contexts of these different um, state uh, formations, you know, formulations um, of, of secularism and the political pressures uh, of citizenship and so on on them. But the point that Gita just raised was actually part of my next question which is that all of you in different ways touch upon the role of right-wing women within fundamentalist movements. Um, and for many feminists today, they would argue that we cannot ignore this phenomenon and that we have to see it as an expression of women's agency, in fact, as some have argued. How would you respond to that and the attack on, as Gita just pointed out, the very certain, a certain concept of, of secularism as a Western one that has been imposed through epistemic and political violence on colonized societies and oppressed peoples. Um, these critiques of secularism and secular feminism have of course gained a great deal of academic prestige 
in Western institutions. Um, so I, I'm aware that all of you come from different places and different relationships to academic institutions um, and to activism, but I would love to hear your reflections uh, since you, know, you do talk about uh, the participation of women um, in, in these right-wing movements, fundamentalist movements, politicized movements, however we, whatever terms we use. Um, so just brief reflections on that. Please. Okay, maybe I will start this time um, because um, in in my paper I do take the case study of ultra orthodox Jewish women as an illustrative case study to outline the relationship between Zionism, ne uh, neoliberalism, and Jewish uh, religion. And I think what the um, uh, Rohini uh, mentioned towards the end of what she said is very important that it, it's not just a question of religion and the state, but which version in religion. And in Israel, for example, only one version of the Jewish religion, religion is allowed, the Orthodox uh, one um, mm -hmm. normally. Uh, um, other versions of uh, religion, conservative, uh, liberal, um, uh, whatever, uh, are, are not recognized um, legally. And that's one of the sources of tension, for example, at the moment between Israel and the American Jewish diaspora, inc including um, the many who are support, uh, supporting Israel. Uh, in, in this version of the Jewish uh, religion, um, which is allowed in Israel, women are fundamentally discriminated against because, for example, they are not recognized in religious court as witnesses at all. They um, are not allowed to initiate uh, divorce, um, even if their husband lives with other women and and, and, and so on, but they uh, refuse to um, care for the husband's dirty clothes and, and feet. They are declared as rebelling women and are not allowed to maintenance and, and, and so on and so forth. At the same time, unlike some other um, uh, religions, in the Orthodox Jewish religion, women have always been active outside the home because they were the breadwinners. The men would study and the women, in addition to main, maintain um, the house and the home and the children would also be expected to provide uh, livelihood. That made them um, quite active and this is a general uh, tendency, um, as, as uh, you mentioned in, in your question about right, uh, right wing and, and, and fundamentalist women to be um, um, very active politically. Uh, for example, among the settlers in um, the um, West Bank and, and the own uh, settler women are very, very active and um, uh, and, and, and the children and, and the home is package of what um, is being done for the sake of um, the, the nation, the religion, and the ultimate uh, coming of the uh, Messiah. At the same time, uh, and that we come back to your question, which I think Saba Mahmoud uh, has been kind of the main um, a carrier of this kind of ideology that uh, feminism is a Western uh, concept and, and what we, we need to look at is women agency and empowerment. These women do have agency, these women have empowerment, but at the same time, first of all, they carry it in service of an ideology which ultimately deal with subjugation to 
women uh, to uh, uh, to men because uh, while women are allowed to earn the living a livelihood, uh, they are not allowed to have any kind of superior um, political power. One of the uh, funny thing in terms of political compromise was that Golda Meir was allowed to be recognized as Israeli prime minister because the prime minister is just one among equal ministers, it's just prime. But she was not allowed to be the mayor of Tel Aviv because then it's hierarchically, she would be superior to uh, anybody else. So, so these are kind of the, the, the issues in which this kind of um, fights are going on. But the main thing is that this empowerment and this agency is in the service of a racialized, colonial, and exclusionary ideology, which is on account of both of other women and men uh, who are not part of the body politics and the ethno-religious nation that they are supporting. So we cannot just look at women's empowerment in this decontextualized way, which this kind of carriers of this post-secular ideology do, you have to look at it in the whole political context and what this political context, um, this empowerment is, uh, is for. Can I come in here? Oh, lovely. Uh, because I think that the way I look at it, this is a political issue. In other words, it's not just a question of agency, empowerment, and so on. Women have stakes in certain regimes and certain dispositions. And some of them are easy to understand. For instance, you have the Islamic Republic of Iran. You have a new clerical elite. They have daughters, etc. These are the apparatchiks of the regime. They have a stake in the regime. They are politically engaged in that regime, as indeed did the followers of the Nazi regime, even though the slogan was Kinder Kirche, children, kitchen, and church. So we have to be very clear that women are political uh, you know, subjects and that they have political stakes, power stakes. Now, the more uh, perplexing aspects of this for me have always been women who are not necessarily the winners, but who are at the bottom of the pile. It has always been very interesting for me, for example, to note that uh, a lot of the AKP uh, voters in Turkey, just as the ruling regime was beginning to eat in to the already acquired rights, were women, women of popular classes. Very simply, <clears throat> there were actual transfers of services, welfare, and so on to these women who had a stake in that. But more important than this, and I have written many moons ago an article called Bargaining with Patriarchy, where I argued that however oppressive a system may appear, there are areas of, if not empowerment, protection and security. So that giving these areas up without seeing the appearance of a regime that secures the interests of women produces a rallying around against the existing hierarchical, very unequal regime. And women are always Bill. thematically Bill. frightened by power holders. Well, I just, for 49 quid a year, I've just subscribed to New State from online. They give you this free book, which has got some brilliant. Do you know? I didn't know this. Helen, can we please mute her? I'm sorry about this. Um, I'm looking. Helen, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that, Denise. Yeah, well, I sort of lost my thread, not, not completely. What I'm saying is that these women are not misguided, suffering from false consciousness and so on. They have actual stakes in what's going on. And, you know, the favorite sort of patriarchal ploy has been to frighten women. Look at England, you know, the suffragette movement, 
all these hordes of people saying, careful, look at all you're losing. It's going to be dreadful. And loads of women buying into this, the anti-suffragette movement. We've always had this. And I think that the way we have to look at this is very strategically in terms of a differentiated approach to the stakes that women have in different types of right-wing and reactionary politics. They're not similarly situated. There are class differences between them, caste differences, et cetera. So this is not, we cannot speak of a sort of fundamentalist women, right? We can't make these categories. We have to figure out, oh dear, I think we're back to the same interference here. Okay. And now I can't, Rashmi, you're muted. Okay, ah. I said I'm going to find her and try and mute okay. Helen. Okay, so what I'm proposing here is to just to throw out all generalizations and do case by case accounts because they're very different. Take Nira's example, fascinating. Supposedly, you know, economic empowerment was supposed to be the key to so many things, not at all, right. <laughs> you know? So therefore, I think that the various components of these buy-ins, I call them buy-ins, if you like, uh, or bargains, if you like, have to be looked at individually and very, very carefully to get a full picture of what's going on. Thanks. Thank you, Denise. Uh, I think yeah. Lisa or Roy. Can I, can I, sorry, can I just bring um, a quote from one of the uh, Jewish women, uh, women that I uh, interviewed in uh, East London, uh, ultra orthodox, which exactly illustrate what Denise said. This woman um, who had about uh, eight children and she, she worked and she came back and, and she said, if I would have come back from work and I've seen my, my husband sit and watch television while I have to look after children and clean the house and so on, I would have been very resentful. But he is studying, he's helping to bring the Messiah. And therefore, I am helping him to help to bring the Messiah, and I am very satisfied with my lot. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Rohini, do you want to speak? Um, yes. Um, well, two things. One is this idea of it being colonial and coming from the West. Well, um, I think in terms of whether it's the Catholic Church, or the right-wing evangelical sects, they are actually sending out this ideology on abortion bans, which is oppressive to women, uh, to various third world countries. So I, I can't see that this is coming the other way from below upwards. It's coming, it's a kind of colonizing ideology which is being sent out. Secondly, on this question of agency, yes, right-wing women do have agency. Um, but they are using that agency um, to oppress others, women in the first place, and also in some cases, men, minorities, etc. cetera. Um, if some guy is beating his wife or a woman is beating her child, that is agency. We don't, you can use your agency to oppress other people. We don't support using agency to oppress other people. We support using your agency to oppose oppression. And so we would support those who are opposing the kind of oppression which is meted out by right-wing women or being supported in various less obvious ways as um, Mira and Denis were explaining, you know, that women may not um, directly, uh, they're not, directly responsible for violence, maybe, but they are responsible by upholding a system which meets out violence. It's one thing to have control over your own decisions, to say, for example, I don't want to have an abortion, I think it is wrong. That's fine. I think no one should be able to force a woman to have an abortion uh, if she doesn't want it. But to force a decision on another woman or girl who does want to terminate a pregnancy um, is 
that I think is oppressive. So you can use your agency to prop up your own rights, to fight for your own rights. But if you use your agency to deny rights to someone else, um, then that is uh, an oppressive use of, it, of agency. And we have to oppose it. Yeah. Thank you, Rohini. And before I ask uh, Geeta to respond, uh, just a request to all the participants, could you please mute your uh, microphones because it's interfering when the speakers are making their presentations. Um, okay, Geeta, over to you. Geeta, Geeta, you're on mute. I try and be polite, of course, to mute myself, but then, okay. <laughs> Hindutva is a good example of a highly masculine movement, uh, which in its main, um, uh, in the RSS, so the sort of father of the Hindutva move, uh, of the movement, the main controlling organization is extremely male. But it has a very, very powerful and visible presence of women right through it, not only as recipients, which I think um, I'd rather talk about a bit later of um, uh, benefits that Denise had mentioned, which certainly applies, but as political actors. So we have had in the Hindutva government, a defense minister, in fact, the, both the finance and defense minister have been the same person, uh, but a woman, um, education ministers and so on. Um, some of the earliest, uh, perhaps one of the first people who became famous through the circulation of cassettes, classically using, you know, what we've called the, the fundamentalist use of the media, uh, hate speech in cassettes uh, was Sadhvi Ritambara, in other words, a female Sadhu, a god woman rather than a god man, who urged violence, who um, fought for the destruction of this mosque, the Babri Masjid, one of the key events in the Hindutva historical narrative. Um, and uh, there are women's wings to the Hindutva organization, some of which were um, enabled to promote Hindutva messages, anti-Muslim hate messages, including justification of the rape of Muslim women, but also who were then formed into uh, women's armies, the Durga Vahini, for instance, which took a more active part uh, in violent protests. So you have women seeded throughout the system uh, of the Hindutva groups um, because violence is absolutely core to its ideological purposes and the promotion and propagation of violence by women is core to that. And I think we'll discuss later uh, issues around marriage and the policing of boundaries. Caste has been mentioned by Omu Abraham in the comments. Um, I don't think Hindutva solves the problem of caste. What it's trying to do is something quite complex, which is a, a huge reordering of caste, both upper caste consolidation, as well as appealing to oppressed caste to join the Hindutva fold and gain some, also gain some uh, empowerment through that. Um, and, and that's quite a complicated uh, process. And Dalits are very much targets of the wrath of Hindutva gangs, as well as Muslims um, and Christians and other minority, minorities. So it's, 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 it's reordering society in a massive way. Um, and of course, women, are, uh, I'm to we're talking at the moment of women's involvement in that, and I'll keep for later women's, um, you know, the way in which women are controlled by it. Okay, thank you all for another round of very stimulating uh, contributions. And again, uh, there's lots here that we could talk about uh, if time was not a limit. Um, so I'll move on to my third question, which is that all of you, of course, some more explicitly than others, also address the ways in which the, the reign of neoliberalism, you know, and of course there's, you know, whole literature about that term itself, uh, but in its general sense, the way in which we understand it and the kind of attendant crises around it, far from acting as a break on fundamentalist movements, far-right movements, uh, 
in many cases seems to have fueled them. Um, so could each of you say something about this, especially with regard to the specific contexts in which you have been thinking about these issues? Um, Do I start? Okay. Now, I think that in the Turkish case, when we look at the sort of long durée of Islamization of the public sphere and the erosion of the secular state such as it was, we have to go back even before the 80s and the neoliberal surge and recognize the role of geopolitics and of green belt policies that were encouraged by the CIA. So in Turkey, it is in the context of combating communism that an infrastructure of associations, Quranic schools, press, etc., was created starting from the 1960s. The inflection that happened with neoliberalism was that for the first time, there was a very rapid empowerment of new factions of capital, previously state-backed capital, because the main motor of finance remained. You know, it was the period of import substitution industrialization, and there were some big corporations which were the main beneficiaries of credit and other state largesse. With the 1980s, we saw a diversification of sources of finance, Gulf money, a diversification of entrepreneurs with the export-oriented drive that created a whole new group of entrepreneurs called at the time the Anatolian Tigers. These were conservative, provincial, pious businessmen. So from then on, obviously, you've had this surge, which could not have culturally been as significant if it hadn't been for the deregulation of media and education. With the deregulation of education, you started getting new players into the provision of education. And many of them, the an expand, massive expansion of both public Islamic schooling and private, especially in the hands of certain jamaats. So what you've had was the rapid creation of cadres that basically substituted what were meant to be the secular cadres of the state and uh, introduced uh, individuals affiliated to the ruling Islamic party or affiliated to the various jamaats, which were always there, but became more and more politically significant because you've had political Islam in certain political parties since the 1970s. So you've had this long over a period of, I would say, 40 years or so, gr gradual transformation of the body politic, including the state apparatus. In other words, to summarize, what kept the Turkish state, shall we say, secular or relatively autonomous, was the fact that there were competitive meritocratic entrance examinations to the civil service, to the diplomatic corps, to military colleges. And what happened in the 2000s was that this recruitment mechanism broke down entirely. Some jamaats infiltrated it, exams were stolen. And as a result, critical key state apparatuses, principally the judiciary, the police force, sections of the army, many parts of the civil service, were actually occupied by Islamic forces of various stripes. It ended in disaster when one of these factions that had become very powerful attempted a failed military coup in July 2016, which led to regime change in Turkey, the collapse of multi-party parliamentary democracy and the transition to an executive presidency which is for all intents and purposes one man rule. So this process, if you like, 
ended in actual regime change, okay? But it was a very long process in which neoliberalism was but one decisive ingredient, but not the whole story. Thank you, Denise. Yes, not the whole story. Um, okay, who wants to go next on this question? Gita, Roini, Neera. Gita, you're on mute. Roini, do you want to take Hi. it? Yeah, you're on mute, Roini. I'll no. go after Gita. I'm not okay. 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 Gita, then. Let's get high down. I, many of the processes that um, Denise described have been happening in India, not uh, in, in that this project is so vast that it is, it, there's a systematic takeover of institutions and the undermining of institutions that had guaranteed some form of. Um, uh, of autonomy and independent decision making. So you don't have censors of the press sitting with scissors, as you would have had at one point, or blue penciling newspapers, but there's a corporate takeover of most of the public television houses and newspaper houses to make them to conform to the government agendas without, uh, without the need of an official censorship body. Um, of course, there's a resistance to that in online media and other things, but it's it's highly contested. So what you have is a form of capital, which is not only where the government is not only taking over parts of, of as, as, as Denise described, the administration or appointing judges who will be sympathetic and so on, um, and, and where the police are certainly acting on political orders beyond their, their, their duties uh, and so on, but also the, the favoring of certain corporate bodies who are international bodies. So this is a movement that has its tentacles that spreads all over the world. The Adani group, for instance, which is one of the favored groups, which both contributes to the coffers of Hindutva, but also has benefited from it, has got mining contracts, but not only in India, but also abroad in Australia, Latin America, and so on. And there are many campaigns against it. So this is um, a form of kleptocratic capitalism promoted by the state, which is a very specific form of neoliberalism, which, which um, Amrita Chachi has analyzed as authoritarian neoliberalism, which plays some of the games that have been expected by the World Bank in terms of women's empowerment, giving direct transfers of cash to women, uh, talking about their empowerment, talking about the girl child, um, giving gas cylinders or building toilets, in other words, electoral campaigns and welfare campaigns that focus a lot on women, but have changed from a rights-based entitlement, which had been fought for and achieved under previous governments, to the personal gift of the prime minister. Uh, and this has been, so far, a very successful electoral strategy in spite of mass campaigns against it. The farmers in India have been agitating all across India in public movements against the corporatization, uh, you know, new land laws coming in, which will corporatize agriculture. Um, the, the, the Muslim women's uh, campaign uh, on citizenship, which we mentioned at the beginning, was a campaign for their rights to their homeland, to, to Vatan, to being indigenous. Uh, it was a challenge to uh, the idea of, um, of Muslims as aliens and a challenge to the idea that they have to be controlled uh, through population control measures. So counterintuitively to many other fundamentalisms which want to increase their population, the control of Hindutva is so, I mean, the so-called Hindu population is so vast that Hindutva policies are bent on population, bringing back population control methods, removing the kind of reproductive rights agenda that, that women's rights groups had fought for, and having coercive population control measures where benefits and, uh, and, and even standing for, for office doesn't happen if you have uh, 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 more than two or three children, which actually would affect many of their own cadres. Uh, but they push this as an anti 
Muslim measure because there, there's been a huge, I mean, enormous amount of publicity about uh, Muslim rates of population growth, uh, uh, a, a huge uh, scaremongering among, among it, uh, about it, and therefore the justification um, for uh, limiting this growth. So you have, but that can come, uh, you know, be seen as part of national population control measures which are coming back into fashion in coercive ways. I mean, in England, for instance, benefits have been cut for extra children in, in the family before uh, beyond a certain number with virtually no protest about it. Um, so, you know, these things are happening internationally and you see aspects of them happening um, in, in, uh, in India uh, with a particular focus on both uh, engaging women's participation in the Hindutva project, but also controlling their sexual autonomy. And one of the key ways of doing that is to, and it's been a very long project, long before they got into power, to undermine um, the, the one secular uh, or, or civil law which allowed interreligious marriage. Um, uh, and to actually it start, the undermining of that is now happening apace with, with laws being passed against religious conversion and so-called love jihad, what's called love jihad. That is the sneaky manner in which Muslim men are supposedly seducing Hindu women. That, that's the way around it always is. Uh, the, the anxiety is, it, is uh, seducing Hindu women and getting them to convert and um, you know, drawing them into Islam rather than uh, allowing them to uh, remaining within their communities. So there's a policing of interreligious relationships, which of course, paradoxically, is probably encouraging conversion because there's no other way in which women can get married in interreligious marriages when the courts have become unsafe spaces where the gangs uh, are actually uh, looking at what's going on in the courts and finding couples and intimidating them and their families. Even sometimes where it used to be individual Hindutva groups, now it's the state. The police will arrest a woman and send her to a woman's shelter. She'll have to uh, uh, speak for herself and so on. Your concluding point on this? So, so well, my, the... my point is simply that women are being included in the Hindutva project through uh, welfare measures. They're also, and some of them may be the same women, you know, because these, these, this is what happens to um, uh, Hindu women, uh, uh, you know, who, who choose to marry out of their community fold. Uh, and on the other hand, as in some cases in the West, there's also a sense that uh, the Hindutva government will protect Muslim women from Muslim men. Uh, and so Muslim women's uh, rights campaigns have been taken over and subverted to suit Hindutva agendas. Okay, thank you. Um, Rohini, you want to go next? Yeah, I'll be brief because um, I haven't really said very much about neoliberalism in my paper, but just responding to what uh, some of the other papers and some of the other comments, um, I had a question whether we could really call the kind of um, capitalism which where basically the most powerful capitalists, the ones who are progressing at a fantastic speed and you know, uh, getting richer, are uh, the ones who are linked to the party in power uh, and very closely linked um, as in India. So I think once we've got to that place, um, we could think of some other, well, whether we call it kleptocratic capitalism or some other name. Uh, Brownie capitalism? Yes, yes, whatever, yes. It's uh, no longer pure neoliberalism. But I think if um, in the lead up to that, um, where you have had a state which has been somewhat, um, somewhat secular or has been in the main secular as it was in India initially, um, the privatization of what should be state functions, especially um, education, for example, can definitely leave space for you know, fundamentalists to come in 
and gain so much power that they actually train people to go, go and you know take over state power at they infiltrate at all levels of the bureaucracy the police the judiciary and and so on um, and so the, if you look at it as that kind of process I, I'm not sure if one would call that neoliberalism or simply lack of a provision of basic services by the state that can definitely lead to the development of uh, um, well, a religious state, really, a polit politicized religion. Yeah. Thank you, Roini. Uh, Neera. Yeah. Um, the ideology of neoliberalism at the beginning was supposedly to protect the economic sphere from the political sphere. Mm -hmm. But of course, for neoliberalism to act successfully, it needed to control the political in order to have an infrastructure of a functioning society and social order, uh, roads, transportation, uh, educated people for its uh, needs and so on. And therefore this chronic uh, capitalism, whatever we call it as neoliberalism, whatever, has become more and more uh, entwined uh, together. In Israel, the picture, and I think in India uh, as well, the, the picture has been, and, and of course in, in, in Turkey as well, a kind of, uh, of, of uh, three powers together. I mean, in Israel after 67, the process of neoliberalization and religionization of state and society have happened simultaneously. And although there have always been tensions and as I explained about what is happening with the uh, um, present uh, government, uh, uh, this tension sometimes can erupt also to popular um, resistance movement on, 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 on uh, both sides. Basically, there have been a collusion because what we are seeing is that um, with the privatization of the state, uh, in order to have uh, a, a more space for a, a private kind of firms. For example, universities has been starved. Because they've been starved, they had to get new sources of money. One of the sources of money is to get um, a special courses for ultra-Orthodox women, which create a sexual segregation in the university. Similarly, also uh, a military um, um, student uh, transforming university campuses to, uh, to, to semi-military uh, uh, camps. So they all um, act um, together. At the same time, because of the uh, hegemony of the Zionist uh, project, um, there have always been particular um, economic interests. I mean, neoliberalization can do investment in various, um, in various branches, but in Israel, the securitization and militarization of the post-67 occupation provided lots of scope for security and surveillance industries, which have had a lot of uh, success. And as a lot of research by Jeff Hartman and, and others uh, have shown, the Palestinian occupied territories have been become live laboratory for these neoliberal uh, companies to be experimented on. And then uh, the whole global neoliberal, as well as uh, a, 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 a private and public um, a, a gov a governments uh, have become uh, open. So we see that the three are going together and um, are colluding in terms of some interest, although on, of course, on a post personal level, and like we talked about um, uh, the women um, a, a issue, but of course, for example, the labor market of ultra Orthodox uh, women, they always used to work within their community as teachers, as, as, as uh, uh, carers and, and all this kind of thing, but it became uh, saturated. So they have gone to outside 
uh, companies. So they had to maneuver their own kind of strategies between their domestic duties and their work duties. And they earned, because they uh, worked less hours, they earned less maybe even secular workers, but more than they would have earned within uh, the community. But this kind of agency maneuverability, to go back to the second question, where in constraints within a space mediated by the politics in between the neoliberal uh, companies, the state, and of course, uh, the rabbis of the ultra-Orthodox um, communities. And last but not least, the extreme poverty of uh, uh, many, fami uh, many families with uh, many children have been dealt with in such a way that the welfare have become privatized, but not to subsidies of settling in the occupied territories. This is why so many people who did not have because of the neoliberalization of the state, many people who had no interest in religion or religious fundamentalism found themselves moving to live in the uh, settlement um, in the occupied uh, territories uh, as a way of uh, populating ju so-called Judaizing uh, them and uh, become captive to this uh, religious um, um, fundamentalist ideology. So we see the collusion of all these uh, three um, uh, uh, governance agencies. Um, thank you, uh, Nira. Gita, you had your hand up, but maybe I was thinking we could take a few questions and then at the end uh, have some concluding remarks, just one minute for each of you. Um, so if you want to add something or respond to what someone else has, um, has said. Um, so I think um, I, we would invite our uh, listeners to send us their questions uh, in the chat, um, on the chat column. And, uh, but I want to first thank all the four uh, speakers who, I don't know how you've managed to pack in so much nuance <laughs> and complexity both at the level of thinking about the larger terms and frameworks uh, that we are working with, uh, the, the strengths and limitations of that, but also the specific, you know, historical um, and, you know, geo geopolitical specificity of, you know, where you work from or uh, what you work on. It's, uh, it was just a very, very uh, stimulating um, set of contributions. So thank you for that. And I think what we should do is take a few questions. We don't have time for uh, too many. Um, and what I would suggest is that instead of each of you uh, responding to each of the questions, maybe we could have a couple of people uh, responding um, and you can take turns doing that. Uh, and then at the end, we could have, um, if you want to make some concluding remarks uh, where you also reference uh, what the other participants have said, um, you know, you will have a chance for that. Um, so is that okay? Yeah, so thank you. Um, and um, Stephen Cowden is going to help me if I miss um, some questions. But uh, the very first one is actually a question which was on my list of questions, but I left it out because I knew someone was, was going to ask it. And this is a question from Amy J, uh, who asks, do you feel the increased desecularization of nation states around the world and the growing focus on ethno-nationalist politics made what is happening in Afghanistan to be viewed as legitimate in some quarters. And she says, I asked this because as a fairly young person, I remember a time even 10 years ago when the idea of a Taliban run state had opposition from all around, whereas Taliban 2.0 seems to use the same arguments that other ethno politicians uh, use. 
So um, I know Denise and Geeta had uh, uh, wanted to speak to this, but of course others can as well. But if we want just a couple of responses, perhaps Neera and Roini, you could say it in your concluding remarks. Um, so Denise, do you want to? Right, yes, I think um, the confusion on Afghanistan and what's happening there is because there's a sort of arrested development in Afghanistan in conceptual terms. What's happened after the first uh, overthrow of the Taliban after the 2001 terrorist attacks, basically, was that from world feminists, there was a very divergent reaction. On the one hand, you had those who were decrying American imperialism and pointing constantly to Bush and Blair's respective wives for wanting to save Afghan women. And on the other, you had the celebratory, what I called at the time, you know, uh, a, a form of gender activism, which was donor-led gender activism, which was celebratory when in fact, both of them were nonsense because like every other country, uh, Afghanistan had its own dynamics and it had its own women's movements, which had started way before, you know, the Americans intervened and occupied, when, as you know, they were in exile in the diaspora, some of them having fled the outrageous uh, situation under the Mujahideen during the Soviet invasion. So the Afghanistan situation is so politicized that nobody will ever tell you about the atrocities of the Mujahideen and what they did to women because they were CIA funded and the Taliban now. A lot of people will talk about the Taliban now, and this is what a colleague of mine called the imperialism of fools or the imperialism of idiots. I can't remember which, that this is a national liberation movement. They are putting an end to the occupation. Ask the Afghans, many of them will say this is another occupation. Why is that? Well, obviously, because there are peculiarities to the Afghan situation whereby the Pashtuns are both, they want to be the state bearing people, even though the census says that 40% of Afghans are Pashtuns, Pashtun dominance has been a problem and the other ethnic components of Afghanistan, some of them now are marginalized like the Tajiks and some of them are literally obliterated like the Hazaras. So this is the situation. And I think that moving beyond that, one has to understand what the American occupation has in fact done, you know, apart from the celebratory, it liberated women, everybody studied, etc. Yes, there was a bubble in Kabul. What I find most intriguing, not only in Afghanistan, but in the world generally, is that whereas, Initially, secularism was seen as a top-down imposed ideology and Islamization was bottom up. Now in the 21st century, it's turned the other way around. You have societies which have younger generations, higher education, higher aspirations, higher expectations, much more globalized, much more collected who balk at the thought of being controlled by a totalitarian, because that's what it is, theocratic regime. Think back on the Arab Spring, all the young people in the streets, in Cairo, in Tunis, they were not asking for uh, Islamic law. They were asking for bread, dignity, and freedom, none of which they got. The point is, which government, Taliban or otherwise, in the 21st century is able to contain societies that even in Afghanistan have become much more sophisticated, much more educated and so on. It is a fact that there is a whole generation of women that have not grown under the Taliban, who have always gone to school and they will try to resist. They will try to organize themselves to resist. To finish my comment, not to eat into anything else, what is the international reaction to this? 
And I find something that I have to share with you totally fascinating. It is a press release by the special rapporteur on violence against women uh, of the UN Human Rights Division, who wrote a long explanatory note saying that we must distinguish between shariat, which is a code of ethics, and fiqh, which, is, which deals with changing laws. And the Taliban have got it wrong. They're applying Islam in the wrong way. There are, in any case, very many varieties of matabs, etc. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it is conceding, actually, that a form of rule where religion, however interpreted, is the main uh, source of legislation is accepted. So here's the UN Human Rights Division engaging with that and voiding the possibility altogether of having some secular arrangement whereby the Shias who are Hazaras can live in peace and not get massacred, whereby women do not have to forego schooling, etc. What I find most disheartening is two things. First, the fact that the international community is bending over the UN Human Rights Division, no less. And second, that there is absolutely no sociological recognition of what these societies are actually about, OK? And what they consist of. Who are these people? Why would they want to be ruled by the Taliban? They don't want corruption. The former government made the word kleptocracy didn't go far enough to describe what they were doing. I mean, they were selling you know, jet fuel in Zabul in the middle of the offensive. The Afghan forces fuel was being sold. Okay? That is how corrupt it was. Nonetheless, I find it extremely disheartening that we're still talking with the terms of 2001. 20 years later, we're stuck in the same place, basically. And that's my answer. Thank you, Denise. Um, I think the piece you were referring to is by Gilbert Ashkar. Possibly, the, yes. The anti-imperialism of food. I yeah, think. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Uh, thanks for that. Gita, do you want to come in on this? And uh, another request to participants, you can please send your questions in the chat uh, by pressing the chat button. Thank you. Yes, Gita. That was a wonderful roundup, Denise. De uh, Denise has done a lot of work in Afghanistan. And um, so it was uh, it, it has made what I'm trying to say much easier. Um, Feminist Dissent issued a solidarity statement. And if people are interested, they can go to our website or, or, or check it out on uh, Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, uh, in solidarity with Afghans. And I think many Afghans, not only in Kabul, feel that this is being imposed on them by a foreign state. And so it's a start of another occupation that they didn't want. Um, and certainly women's demonstrations, as we know, are breaking out everywhere. But, but I think Denise's point that the issue of secularism, perhaps fortunately, has been grabbed from being a top-down thing and taken and because it's been so relentlessly attacked in the academy has been so relentlessly attacked even by the counter-terror and counter-extremism people who said that they were opposed to muslim fundamentalism the only thing they were doing was trying to find the right muslim fundamentalists and usually these were not secular muslims of any sort but one fundamentalist or another in order to control other muslims and as, as a British person, I've seen this happening in Britain at a local level, but the actors were all involved with international movements. So in Britain, you have Taliban supporters, you have Al-Qaeda networks, you have the Jamaat-e-Islami, you have the Muslim Brotherhood. Many of the exiles that went back after the so-called Arab Spring had spent their exile in Britain. And there were teary um, endorsements of them by the security services, by British diplomats, saying that they have understood our system and they see how we protect rights and they're going to go and implement those rights in Tunisia, Egypt, uh, and so on. And of course, none of that happened. 
And one of the reasons why we had um, this, uh, we wanted to have this uh, issue was that the fundamentalisms that we are talking about in the Turkey, the Muslim Brotherhood case, in India, Hindutva, was seen, have been seen as partners to counter the extremism of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And, and what we're seeing now happening to Afghanistan is that Erdogan, I believe, is, is stepping in and saying he run Kabul airport. The Muslim Brotherhood, as Denise pointed out much earlier, has always been part of CIA and Western intelligence policies. So for a little while, some of the far right, uh, is, you know, uh, neocons, decided that they didn't like the Brotherhood and Jamaat Islami either. But basically, the thread through Western policy is that we need a strong man, they need to be a religious strong man, and they need to be imposed on certain places, because we cannot manage it directly ourselves. So the defeat of humanitarian intervention is the triumph in a new form of a very old strategy. And that's why it's happening. And this time, the UN is promoting it as well, along with the entire academy that attacked um, the idea that rights were universal and that Afghan women or any other women would want to have rights. Thank you. <laughs> oh, depressing. <laughs> Rohini and Neera, would you want to come in on this and sort of the, the larger question? Um, Rohini, you do want to, okay. Um, participants, are there other questions, um, comments, uh, if you want to speak, uh, make yourself visible um, and you can ask your question or make a comment um, or respond to- Just to say, Rashmi, there's, it's a question about India. Um, okay. Yeah. The uh, the from from Amu Abraham in India. The question, the issue may not be so much a definition of secularism as separation of the state, but of caste and the central position it occupies in the majority religion, which is Hinduism. And the 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 person who made that comment said, CAA protests defended the Ambedkarite constitution. So that's that's a question about India. So uh, shall we take that now then? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I can see Amu who asked the question. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Gita or Rohit? I was going to say, maybe Amu would like to speak to it directly. Yes, yeah. Amu, would you want to speak to it? We'd love to hear your point uh, can you unmute yourself amu we can't hear you unmuted yes can you hear now yes yeah so it was not so much a question as just a thought that uh, because i think quoting amrita or something geeta you had said that uh, uh, I, I thought you said that about Nehru, which I don't disagree with, about Nehru's role in this and all that. I was just trying to point out that when we look at Hinduism, what is Hinduism? Hinduism is nothing if you don't look at it as a rigid form of uh, caste hierarchy, basically. So even when you look at uh, how these women uh, of Hindutva uh, are mobilized, how does the RSS manage to mobilize so many women behind it? I feel that it has a lot of caste. And uh, what I was saying about the constitution is that it was not so much just Nehru, who was responsible for it, but Ambedkar, who was re responsible for it, and he's called, we call him the father of Indian constitution, and he has taken universal declaration of human rights, all these universal rights, and put it into the Indian constitution, and uh, that's why I called it an Ambedkarite constitution. And he won at the time of the independence, so before independence itself that if you struggle and get 
political independence and political democracy mm -hmm. it will be very dangerous without because you we do not have social democracy because caste is so rigid and so deep in our society and today what we consider to be fascism or proto fascism is so deeply connected to the structures of caste and uh, that's the point i was trying to make and that explains why women are mobilized and women are mobilized on the hindutva ideology but partly also on caste basis like whether it is the uh, durga vahini whether it's a vhp all of them have certain caste basis they don't really break out across caste uh, barriers yeah. in the sanghavarivar organizations okay thank you amu um would anyone want to respond anyone on the panel anyone in the audience um who, who would like to respond to that um i think geeta you had touched upon it uh briefly in one of your previous presentations uh is there anything to add you're on mute geeta no i i completely agree with amu uh, i think caste is absolutely central but it's this, it's both the consolidation and the reordering and the the fact that these are going on at the same time is very hard to uh unpick sometimes but one of the things that's happening is that precisely because the constitution the preamble to the constitution has become a popular document it's not a top down document anymore it's not part is not seen as part of the state project but the state is undermining it the people are reading it so in the muslim women's protest in lawyers groups and student groups they read the preamble to the constitution to assert their rights as indian citizens at a time when the whole notion of universal citizenship itself you know who is the bearer of rights is being reduced if you don't have the right documents if you don't have biometric identity if you are not under the system the panoptic eye of state surveillance then you're not a person so even little children whose parents have been killed by covid uh, uh, you know the state is saying oh we can't help them because they don't have a document for us to give them entitlements i mean it's the most astonishingly horrific situation um so so i think what's happening is that that discussion of what amu described as the ambedkarite constitution has been taken into the farmers protests into the muslim women's protests into student groups uh into women's groups uh in order to understand what the constitution was where our rights came from uh, actually ambedkar didn't take the universal declaration because it didn't exist it it was built simultaneously with in with indian input hansa mehta indian feminists put into the indian uh, universal declaration of human rights and ambedkar and others put it back into the Indi those ideas into the indian constitution but also an idea of substantive equality not just a formal liberal idea of rights it is in some ways uh, perhaps a very long rambling and bureaucratic document but it also has very radical ideas in it and these are being found again by dalit groups uh marginalized groups of people to read that constitution for themselves um so as people for have you know are standing in the streets and demanding secularism as in in our in our in the feminist dissent edition we have a personal account of amira ahmed who is a sudanese woman who talks about the women's revolution in sudan which overthrew a very powerful and genocidal regime of president bashir a muslim brotherhood government to demand a secular constitution so this is coming from the bottom up all that stuff that's being taught about it being top down is really out of time if you're a student i'm telling you there are sources of information that you can go to please look for them you know uh, you know abandon uh, looking at queer theory and post modernism as your guide tracks uh, and and post colonial theory and some other mood because they're out of time they have been taken apart by pakistani feminists by bangladeshi feminists by people who are outside the academy and actually doing the work thank you are there any other questions uh, anyone wants to be recognized and to speak um 
Okay, uh, there are more comments. Thanks for the idea of transformative constitution. State is the creation of the constitution and urges it to play an activist role is a comment from Sandali uh, Thakur. Um, I think people are probably absorbing all the material that they have heard. And I am also aware that we only have 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps what we can do uh, is have sort of a last round of comments from the speakers. Uh, Neera, did you want to say something? Yes. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I agree with a lot of what Gita says, but I would not reject, reject wholesale all the gender studies uh, literature and work of uh, in an undifferentiated way that um, that uh, Gita has been uh, doing, but that's uh, a different matter. But what uh, Gita did mention, and I realize that none of us have mentioned the discussion is of course what happened since COVID happened, because our issue has, has been written and um, the articles before COVID, and it's very, important to for us to look what has been the effect of uh, COVID on all this um, uh, interwinding uh, of um, ethno-nationalism, um, uh, religious fundamentalism, and neoliberalism. And of course, what we see is um, two things. On the one hand, um, not only intensification of uh, this kleptocracy that um, uh, was mentioned, but also the um, enhancement with virtually no protest of anti-democratic um, tendencies with most uh, states in which um, a lot, not only the, uh, the unsupervised contracts between governments and various um, private companies uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, provi uh, uh, providing and very often non-providing um, uh, safety uh, equipment and all this um, privatization of the production of the vaccine and, and the, but also the enhancement, enhancing of um, racialized inequalities both locally and globally um, is, um, is a result of that. And that goes very well with um, what we have been talking about. But at the same time, we also see um, that um, like in two places in, in Israel, but especially in the United States, they uh, the, the, the conspiracy theory and the suspicion of the, and the denial of the pandemic by, by Trump and, 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 and um, the, the right wing uh, conspiracy theory, uh, theorists and, 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 and activists have actually have led to uh, toppling them from their power, at least um, uh, temporarily. So, um, we, um, when we talk about entitlement and, and citizenship right and, and especially freedom of speech, I think we need to look at the role of conspiracy theory and right wing um, uh, mobilization around this and the role of social media around the pandemic and how it interrelates to a lot of the issues that we talked about in relation not only to um, intersectional uh, class, uh, uh, ethnic, national, gender uh, in inequalities, both in terms of uh, the labor market and in terms of the victims of the pandemic, uh, but also who benefited both from supporting the surveillance and also resisting the vaccine and uh, opposing the uh, using it as kind of opposing governance and governmentality. And, and uh, I think this is something we should think about in, in terms of updating the special theme of, of our uh, issue. 
Um, thank you, Neera, uh, for, for those uh, very needed uh, remarks. Um, we actually have only five minutes left. And so I was wondering if we could use this time to also hear concluding remarks from Denise, Rohini, and Geeta. And then I think Alison um, would come in and give our vote of thanks to everyone. Um, so Rohini, Geeta, Denise. If, if. Um, we've talked about the way in which um, academia, the UN, um, and, and various other forces, the right wing, the far right, uh, have created an atmosphere where one accepts these extreme right-wing uh, fundamentalist regimes. For me, what is most depressing is the number of people who call themselves socialists or who are seen as socialists who do the same. Um, someone uh, mentioned um, the, the term, I think the term, the anti-imperialism of fools uh, was first coined by Laila Shami, uh, who is a Syrian activist and writer. And she did it in the context of Syria, where sections of the left were supporting the brutal regime of Bashar al-Assad on the grounds that it was anti-imperialist. This acceptance of uh, authoritarian regimes, again, there are people who will support the theocracy in Iran on the grounds that it is anti-imperialist, is part of an axis of resistance to imperialism, et cetera. And this is also, I think this partly explains the response to what has happened in Afghanistan. You know, that people um, are not clear, not clear that this is a disaster for the people of Afghanistan. And not just, I mean, especially the women, but not just the women, the minorities and working people, everyone other than those who actually wield power. So I think this is where we have to really, um, we do need to tackle these arguments. Uh, and I'm very glad to see that feminist dissent is actually doing that. And the, the blog post on Afghanistan I thought was excellent. But this is also, I think, something where we need to take apart any, any arguments which see these right-wing regimes taking over as some kind of a victory of anti-imperialism. It is not. Thank you, Rohini. Um, and of course, we invite all of you uh, to contribute to our blog and to develop you know, some of these themes. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, Geeta and Denise, uh, who wants to? Okay, I, I was just racking my brains about how to finish on a more upbeat note because we've been rather depressing, you know, I do feel for our audience. And what I was thinking was that there is something in a sense unsustainable about what's going on because when you look around, you see everywhere a politics of polarization in the, between those who have stormed the capital in the States and those who recoil in horror, <laughs> as the, the same in, you know, those in, in uh, India who are uh, rooting for the Hindutva and those who are recoiling in horror. So far from having homogenized nation states, we now have a politics of polarization that can only survive by creating, creating enemies within. And in each case, it's a different enemy within. Bolsonaro did the same thing in Brazil, wherever you look. And this, I think, is a profound sense. It's a, it's a, a crisis of legitimacy of the particular phase of neoliberal capital that we have reached. This has failed to produce any trickle down effect. As you know, even, you know, August, uh, you know, uh, capitalist organs like the Financial Times are talking about inequality as the most destabilizing force in our times. So this idea of this being in fact translated into a Kulturkampf, a culture war, so that whether you look at France, wherever you look, 
you have this culture war going on, which is not, and of course, the reason I'm mentioning this culture war is because gender is the main ammunition in this. Whether we're talking about sexual minorities, whether we're talking about women, whether we're talking about transsexuals, one of the fronts, the main front of this culture war is around gender. And I don't believe that this politics is sustainable in the long run. I think I am hoping, maybe I'm being overly optimistic. Certainly when I took look at Turkey, it's burning itself out. The government to shore up its legitimacy is pressing all the buttons, anti-Kurdish sentiment, terrorism, opening Hagia Sophia to be a mosque, all the different reflexes that are that's supposed to mobilize popular, uh, you know, popular support for the government. It's not working. The polls show a steady decline, steady decline in support for the ruling party, even though all the guns are out and they all the weapons have been used. I think that in all societies, in the realities of late 21st century, case by case, it is going to be increasingly unsustainable. How it will be replaced, what will replace it, who will replace it, I cannot say. But I believe that the fight against, you know, uh, gender inequality, against the oppression of women minorities, is going to be the frontline battle of our time. Yeah. Thank you, Denise, for that uh, injection of optimism, at least some amount of it. Uh, Gita. Well, gosh, there's so many things going on. Oh, I Gita. wanted to just, I, 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 in, am I? Yes, I'm on. Uh, in concluding, I wanted to just talk across some of our uh, uh, you know, case studies, um, India and Israel have had a very close relationship for some time. Mm -hmm. And one of the great um, puzzles, if you like, of Hindutva uh, is that it is, it, it emerged, uh, was founded as a contemporary fascist movement with Nazism and uh, Italian fascism, admired Hitler and Mussolini very much, um, but took a lot longer to get to power. Uh, because of the progressive movements that held it off um, in India. But when it did get to power, it retained that admiration for its fascist origins. Uh, but it also, and also from very early on, has been an admirer of the idea of a national homeland and of Zionism. So the links between India and Israel now are not just strategic links, but as a meeting of the Israeli embassy showed that they have compared the founders of Zionism to the founders of Hindutva. Um, and of course, with the Pegasus scandal, we've, you know, have the links of the sort of whole surveillance agenda. And when in India in its second term, the BJP abolished the autonomous status of Kashmir uh, and brought in another law that allowed land to be sold everywhere, this was hailed uh, by the pro-Hindutva people as integrating Kashmir more firmly into India uh, because it had lost this special uh, status. But of course, what it was about and what, what spoke to people was that this was going to be more and more like an occupied territory and that because India so far hasn't settled Kashmir, uh, the rest of India hasn't settled because of, of uh, many border areas in many regions, it's not only Kashmir, have restrictions on outsiders buying land. And in lifting these restrictions, um, uh, as well as um, the autonomous status guaranteed in the constitution, it seems as if um, we're heading for a Palestinian model uh, of handling Kashmir, which is extremely dangerous now, particularly because with what's happened in Afghanistan, all the Pakistan-backed terror groups, which were focused focused on Kashmir and for and for and the reason the fundamental reason why Pakistan wants to control Afghanistan is its policy of what's called strategic depth so that it can concentrate on and attack Kashmir 
So Kash Kashmir is going to, I think, become a battleground. It's already uh, uh, ha ha have had a complete withdrawal of civil liberties from the people living there. Very hard to know what's going on because the internet is heavily controlled and has been down a lot of, 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 of this time, long before COVID, uh, but through COVID and, and, and now. Even the elected leaders ha had been put under house arrest um, and so on. So it's a, it's a grim, very, very grim situation there. Um, but at the same time, this very anti-Muslim government is extremely happy with countries like Turkey and has good relations across the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and so on. And historically, India has been a good friend to Afghanistan, but has sat silent during this crisis, um, basically not reaching out a hand to Afghan refugees, nor using its position on the Security Council. It aspires to lose great power status, but hasn't used it in order to bring any kind of humanitarian dialogue into the situation with Afghanistan. So I think we're in for a very grim time. Uh, I agree with um, Denise, of course, that women are on the, on the front of this battle, uh, as they have been everywhere in Iran, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Sudan, in many, many countries, women have gone out to claim their democratic rights and their secular rights, even though they've been let down by so many other groups. And they will continue to do it as they're continuing to do it in India. And it's becoming for young people and also for older people, the proving ground of a new movement. In India, there's a lot of nostalgia for the period of nationalism where people um, uh, you know, gave up things, they founded institutions. We started with a poem from the uh, Muslim university in India uh, called Jamia Millia. It is a secular Muslim university founded as an institute of learning during a secular national movement. Um, you know, it is, it, it, it's uh, students learn history from excellent historians. Um, you know, there's a film school, they study ar around a range of subjects. It, it's, it is a modern university and it was one of the centers of the Muslim women's struggle and the students' struggle. Um, so that history of secularism is embedded in Muslim lives, not only in India, but across the world. And it is now being claimed as part of movements that they have in this very hard and very long fight that is against that, that people are facing in all these states. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gita. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you, Neera. We are seven minutes over our time. Uh, and it seems like we've just started getting into some of these topics, but I hope this is just the beginning of our conversations. And uh, I hope many of you will contribute um, and write for the Feminist Descent blog um, or for uh, the journal. Um, so thank you for that. Alison, do you want to come back in? Um, I can't see Alison here. Um, yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. here. Yeah. Um, so over to yeah, you. Can I can I just give a vote of thanks to all of the speakers, all of those who were uh, responsible for organizing this gathering, all of you who've come, to the brave women of Afghanistan, Iran, Sudan that uh, various various people here have mentioned, who are holding up the flame to uh, human rights, and uh, also to just to remind you, um, again, on a slightly, a very small scale optimistic note, that this journal is a journal that's, uh, if you like, organized by, both by ac academics and by activists. And we do defend universalism and human rights here. Uh, and that's an important, it's a tiny little intervention, but it's, it's important uh, in relation to um, the kind of dominant discourse in, in certain type, in certain quarters of academia at the moment. So thank you very much, all of you. Please 
um, do keep in touch with Feminist Dissent, download the articles, as I said earlier. Uh, some, some fi a final thing I'd just like to mention is that I mispronounced Amira, Amira Ahmed's, Nira pointed this out to me, um, Amira Ahmed's name when I introduced her wonderful article on, and wonderful and very positive um, article in our Voices of Dissent section on Sudan. So thank you very much, all of you, and hope to see you again at one of our gatherings. Rashmi, could I just say something very quickly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I thoroughly endorse um, every, every all the positive comments. This has been a fantastic uh, discussion, and I really want to thank all the speakers. Just to say the next Feminist Ascent event is going to be something that myself, uh, Sukhwant Daliwal, Rebecca Durand, and... Uh, Pragnan Patel have been working on, which is the whole issue of relationships and sex education. Uh, and we are planning to hold a webinar uh, where we're going to present a briefing paper that we've produced on this. And uh, that will be, we're, we're planning to hold that sometime in October. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to organize this event, organized jointly with the National Education Union, uh, people from the executive of the National Education Union. So we're trying, this is a specific uh, work we've been involved in defending. And, and it's very much a, a local instance of all the same kind of things you've talked about. You've talked about the role of religious, politicized religion and the interventions they've made into education. And, and one of the uh, areas that's on the on the front line for for politicized religion is control of girls education, exclusion of any reference to lesbian and gay people or family diversity. And this is a, this is the, this is the thing that fundamentalists are attacking uh, relationships and sex education. So that will be the next feminist dissent event. So keep an eye on the uh, the, the email that uh, is being sent out, and you'll get a date, and we'll be holding a webinar on that. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and goodbye to everyone.